YouTube House Audio presents Warhammer 40k The Tally Man Written by Anthony Reynolds And narrated by War Wyvern The bridge of the Infidus Diabolus was silent. Nothing moved within its crowded, claustrophobic confines. The servitors hardwired into the controls and consoles were dormant. Their eyes, those of them that still had them, blank and staring. Drool dripped in long robes from gormless grey lips. Long shadows stretched across the lifeless bridge. The lumen strips overhead were uniformly dark, and even the dull green glow of data screens were absent. Every monitor was blank. Well, the only light on the bridge came from the unearthly ochre tinged sky beyond the oculus. On one of the consoles, a small blister light began to flash red, a legless servitor, suspended from the ceiling by a mass of ribbed cables, shuddered and convulsed. Its cataract-ridden eyes rolled back into its head. It had no mouth to speak of, its lower jaw was missing, and a mass of tubes and wires protruded from its throat, coiling up into the ceiling. But the vocabulator box upon its chest crackled with distortion as it awoke from dormancy. Locator beacon activated, it croaked. It was an ugly sound, dry and rasping, though still recognizably human in origin. Locator beacon activated, it repeated speaking into the silence, speaking to no one. Locator beacon activated. Locator beacon activated. Marduk, a dark apostle of the 34th host, knelt in prayer to the dwellers beyond, seeking guidance, when he felt her presence nearby. He rose from the depths of his meditations, bringing his spirit form back from its rangings. There was the familiar jolt as his hell-promised soul became anchored within his flesh body once more, meshing into every fibre of its being. Reality asserted itself. He felt the pull of the ship's artificial gravity upon him, the beat of his primary heart within his chest. He breathed deeply, taking the blood incense deep into his lungs. Behind the cloying, aromatic smoke there was the scent of exotic spices, crushed wildflowers and moist soil. Behind that was the stink of the warp, an electric tang that he could taste on his tongue. Hello, Antigone, he said. There was no answer. He'd not been expecting one. He opened his eyes. One was the dark mahogany common amongst those born of Colchis, the other was a burning red orb, the pupil a jagged black silver. He knelt before his personal shrine, jutting off his cell and arming chamber. An ancient eight-pointed octet taken from Davin was before him, its rough stone surface stained black by the blood of sacrifices. She was close. The smell of wildflowers and spices had grown stronger, and his skin was now tingling, as if the air was charged. There was an uncomfortable scratching in the back of his mind. A drop of bright red blood splashed onto the flagstones before him. He reached up and wiped the blood from his nose. It was always this way with her. Still kneeling, he turned. She was standing there in the shadow of the arched entrance to his shrine, utterly motionless. At a glance, one might have mistaken her for a child. She stepped from the shadow and that illusion was shattered, for while she inhabited the body of a child of perhaps four years of age, she was something distinctly other. Her cowled face was a shuddering blur, like the screen of a wildly shaking, faulty picked viewer. Even to try to focus on her features made his head begin to throb. The scratching in his head intensified. Marduk did not ask how she had entered his sealed chambers, nor how she had escaped her cell once again. 
It seemed it was impossible to hold her. Was there something you wanted, little auger? Marduk said, not even attempting to keep his irritation from his voice. The Infidus Diabolus had been marooned here above this demon world on account of Antigone, or rather on account of Marduk having stolen her from her previous caretaker, the Death Guard Captain Nargalex, and he was beginning to wonder if taking her had been wise. He had not expected her to answer, but she did, speaking directly into his mind with the voice of all the augurs that had come before her. The force of her pulsed into his mind, staggering him and turning the blood dripping from his nose into a torrent. The Tallyman calls. Are you well, my lord? asked Sabtek. The warrior's cold eyes were narrowed. I'm fine, said Marduk. Who is it? They stood on the darkened bridge before one of the cogitators that he had brought back to power. A blip on the screen blinked instantly. I don't know, Sabtek said. Everyone is accounted for, but there is also this. Sabtek tapped a series of commands onto a console screen, and a snippet of a Vox message began to play. It was a garbled mess of sounds, infused with static. Amidst it all was a buzzing drone, like a swarm of insects, a scratching sound, and a distant, mournful bell. But behind all of that there was something else. Repeat that, said Marduk. They replayed the snippet again, applying a series of oral scrubs to eliminate some of the background slush. Now, a single voice could be heard in the midst of the intruding sounds. Taken. Naren is die. Done. Epidem. No. Don't. Don't. Both Marduk and Sabtek recognized that voice instantly though they could make no sense of the fragments of his speech. Enesat, said Marduk. Sabtek and his thirteenth coterie had been chosen to accompany Marduk to the surface of the fetid jungle world. How it was possible for the first acolyte of the host to be down there the gods only knew. He'd been lost aboard the Vox Dominus before the infidus Diabolus had been pulled into this noxious hell dimension but it was undeniable that it had been his voice on the Vox, and the Legion Logator Beacon was blinking insistently upon the screen of the Auspex built into Sabtek's heavily modified bolter. How is the Corypheus? asked Sabtek. Getting worse, said Marduk. Kolbadar had been pierced by a blade wielded by the Death Guard Nargalex, and his condition had rapidly deteriorated in the days since. Sabtek nodded his head gravely. And the witch? I have sealed her within her cell and set a dozen guards for all the good it will do, said Marduk. Are your men ready? They are, said Sabtek. Let's do this, said Marduk. The invisors shot from the belly of the infidus Diabolus, engines roaring as the snub-nosed shuttle flew out into the yellow, poisonous atmosphere beyond the embarkation deck's integrity field. Scores of ships of various size and origin hung in low orbit out there, listing like drowned corpses. They were lifeless, those vessels, and all in various states of decay. Some were imperial while others were clearly Zenos in origin. For others it was impossible to say, so overgrown were they, covered in fungal growths and thick lichen and vines that hung down hundreds of meters from their hulls. Reaching tendrils lifted up towards them from the decaying jungles below. Some battle cruisers and cargo ships had already been ensnared from below, becoming one with the rotting canopy. Where in the name of the Urizen are we? asked Samtek. Marduk had his suspicions, but did not voice them. Not yet. The invests began angling down, towards the surface of the demon world, closing in on the Legion Logator Beacon. 
It dropped through titanic ravines, through a miasma of acidic gas clouds, past immense trees bleeding blood sap from wasted bows, down, down, down towards the darkness of the forest floor. On Sabtek's order, the demon-infused shuttle did not touch down for fear of being unable to lift off once more. It hovered some ten meters off the forest floor, held aloft by the downthrust of its powerful engines. The pilot wary of the sticky fronds of vast carnivorous plants unfurling towards it. It was far enough. The word bearers dropped the rest of the way, each of them landing in a crouch. Marduk landed last, crashing down to the earth within a protective circle formed by Sabtex 13th. He landed in low hunch, balancing himself with one hand to the wet r- ground cover. In his other hand, he held his Crozius Arcanum, his massive, spike-headed mace and the symbol of his holy office. He stared around him from behind the grimacing visage of his skull-faced helm, his armor completely sealed against whatever toxins plagued the air outside. The Invisus lifted away, engines screaming, veering off over the canopy, and disappearing from view. It was unnaturally hot, and rivulets of water ran down the word-bearer's armor place. Swarms of insects clouded the air, many of them bloated to the size of a man's head, with glossy sheened wings and reflective compound eyes. The wet, spongy mulch underfoot writhed with worms and beetles. Bigger things crashed through the branches overhead, sending down flurries of rot, soil, and maggots. The word bearers scanned the underground, bolters shracking for potential threats. How close are we? asked Marduk. Hard to say, said Sabtek. The atmospherics are playing havoc with my Auspex, but not far. Perhaps an hour. It was longer than an hour. It felt like they had been cutting their way through the foul, rotting jungle for weeks but it could only have been hours. At times, the undergrowth was so thick that they had to burn a path with the squad's flamer. They had lost a vox contact with the infidus diabolus, but continued on, honing in on the blinking beacon. Finally, they were close. They scrambled up an overgrown incline and half-climbed, half-dropped down through a collapsed dome that might once have been the apex of a temple but had long been claimed by the fecund, rotting jungle. They took up position, crouching behind overgrown stone balustrades. The thirteenth were exceptionally well drilled, instantly securing a perimeter covering all angles of approach. Below them, in the hollow of what might have been the temple's nave, a creature that was not human worked. It was a repulsive, bloated thing of dead, rotting flesh, Its skin was the color of a month-old corpse left to rot in water. A single curved horn protruded from its forehead. Its arms and legs were spindly and wasted, but its belly was disproportionately distended. In places, its dead flesh was torn, exposing diseased muscle, bone, and organs. It was hunched over a rotting writing table made from bones, worm-riddled wood and twisting branches. Its bulbous head was down as it concentrated on its work, scratching at a huge book opened before. Periodically it dipped its twisted stick of a pen into a black inkwell filled with squirming things. It muttered under its breath as it worked, a deeply sepulchral and completely unintelligible monotonous drone. It sounded as if it were counting. The tally man, breathed Marduk. Great piles of books bound in leather formed, teetering pillars around the demon, each pile slowly being subsumed into the earth. Pale fungal growths clung like limpets to them, and even from here Marduk could see the insects and worms writhing within the bound pages. Beside the demon was a large abacus, taller than one of the Legion's Astartes. 
In place of counting beads, they were skulls. Marduk recognized human, Eldar, and orc skulls. A few of the others were less familiar. Every few breaths, the demon reached out with a spindly, cancer-ridden arm and clicked those skulls along the rods that impaled them before turning back to his work. Sabtek pointed. Marduk nodded, his expression within his skull helm darkening. There was a helmet of the 18th Legion upon the abacus, acting as one of the counting pieces. Nearby was a twisted hourglass. While the sand was clearly falling, it did not appear to empty the top half, nor ever fill the base. It took a moment to realize the tallyman was not alone. The ground around the feet of the demon's desk and Scarborough's chair was undulating with movement. At first, Marduk thought that he sat in the center of a befouled pond, rippling with whatever things lived below the surface, but he saw now that he was mistaken. Surrounding the tallyman were hundreds of tiny, waddling demons, bloated pustules the size of a man's head, each with tiny arms and legs, oversized mouths, and twisted, branch-like horns. They shifted and struggled against each other, trying to get close to the tallyman, pushing and pulling at their comrades. They were completely silent, however, as if unwilling to disturb his work. For its part, the tallyman appeared completely oblivious to the tiny fighting demons. Sabtek presented the screens of his auspex to Marduk. It showed the blinking red light of the locator beacon. They were right on top of it. All that could be heard from below was the scritch-scratch of the demon's nib on parchment, the creak and groan of the rotten trees pressing in upon the crumbled temple, and the low muttering of the tallyman. Sabtek lifted his bolter, customized for long-range sniping. He locked his sight's targeter upon the hunched demon, aiming at the base of its skull. No, said Marduk. We are in a place holy to the Plague Father, possibly the Garden of Nurgle itself. It would not be wise to raise his ire. The Garden of Nurgle? Saptek breathed, lowering his weapon. I believe so, said Marduk. A dull moan issued up from an unseen place below. It was a groan of unnatural pain and torment, and it was most assuredly of human origin. The tallyman paused, glancing up at something out of the word-bearer's eyeshot, something located underneath the overhanging lip of which they crouched. The demon tutted before turning back to its work. Without a word, the word-bearers inched their way around the edge of the dome, until they were granted a view of what had made that pitiful sound. Marduk had been expecting Enesat and while it was a word-bearer, or rather it had once been a word-bearer, it was not his first acolyte. He was strung up on a wooden frame, his arms and legs outstretched. His limbs were still encased in deep red plate, each section incised with holy scripture, but his body and head were bare. The power armor had been peeled off him like the shell of a beetle. That exposed flesh was foully bloated and disease-ridden, bulging with tumors and cancerous growths to such a degree that he looked barely human. His neck was swollen, one of the glands in his throat having expanded to such an extent that it looked akin to the repulsive demons cavorting around the base of the wooden frame upon which he was pinned. His face was a misshapen ruin, his eyes swollen and leaking milky fluid his lips blackened with plague, his swollen mucus-lined tongue lolling from his mouth. But that was not the worst that had been done to him. He'd been opened from neck to belly, his fused ribcage splayed back like cage doors, and his skin and flesh pinned back onto the wooden support frame, exposing his inner organs. Both his primary and secondary hearts were on display, beating fast. His internal organs were disease-ridden and blotchy, with lumpen growths within them. Their surface, 
slick with filth. Things were crawling inside his chest and stomach cavity, nestled amongst his organs. Worms, larvae, beetles, and at least three of the repulsive posture like demons. Flies surrounded him, laying more eggs in his exposed flesh. It was Nahan, the dark apostle of the third host. How he was alive was beyond understanding. What do we do? asked Zaptek. There's nothing to be done for him, said Marduk. He belongs to the grandfather now. We go. Using hand signals, Sabtek ordered his warriors to pull back. Wait, said Marduk. He pointed towards a mound next to Naren, squirming with diminutive plague demons. What is that? Sabtek sighted along his scope for a long moment before lowering it. That, said Sabtek, is first acolyte Enesat. Marduk walked towards the hunched figure of the tallyman. The thirteenth had dropped down to the ground floor of the templum with him, and they fanned out around him now, bolters raised, aiming at the demon. It had not yet noticed them, intent on its work. The tiny demons around the tallyman spotted them first. One of them pointed with a tiny stick-like arm and let loose a piercing squawk. The tallyman's pen slipped, a blot of ink spurting from the nib, and it looked up in displeasure. More of the tiny plague demons were screeching now, scrambling back away from the approach of the word-bearers. The tallyman turned towards them, and Marduk saw its face for the first time. It was repulsive. It had no nose, merely a pair of filth-clogged slits, and a singular misshapen eye, weeping pus and with flies clustered at its corners, peered at them from beneath the curving horn jutting from its forehead. Its wide gash of a mouth gaped open as it saw them, exposing a graveyard of rotting tusks and chisel-like teeth. Worms writhed in its throat. Its eyes widen, and it spluttered and choked in outrage at its work being interrupted by these interlopers. Behind it, Dark Apostle Naren's bleary infected eyes turned towards them. He tried to speak, but nothing came forth except a low moan. At his feet, the sea of tiny demons swarmed protectively towards the tallyman. They tumbled off the mound that was Enesat, exposing him to view. He was on his knees, his arms bound behind his back, his armor was pitted and blistered, his joints and exposed cabling covered in rust and verdigris. He wore his helm still and lifted his head, seeing Marduk and the thirteenth. He tried to rise but fell sidewards. The tiny plague demon swarmed around their master, jabbering and spitting at the approaching word-bearers. They clambered over one another, pushing and shoving, forming a living carpet of foulness around it. They continued to pile in, grabbing its chair with tiny filth-encrusted claws, and lifting it above their combined bulk. Holding the tallyman aloft, the mound of tiny demons rolled afterwards. The word-bearers came to a halt, the tallyman looming above them, held unsteadily above the mass of demons. Why do you interrupt my work, mortal? asked the tallyman, its corpse voice deep and droning. If a cadaver could speak, this was the sound it would make. It was the voice of death itself. Mortal, mortal, the tiny demons holding the makeshift palanquin intoned, speaking as one. Marduk bowed his head in respect. I come to bargain for the life of that warrior, old one, he said, gesturing towards his first acolyte, Enesat. You are a dead thing walking, pledged to another, said the tallyman. Another. Another. You have nothing to offer me, said the demon. Nothing. Nothing. Marduk was momentarily wrong-footed. Pledged to, he said. I do not know what you mean. 
Be gone. I have spoken, and so it shall be. I must return to my work. Be gone. Be gone. With that, the tallyman turned away, borne aloft upon its rolling heaps of demons. Halt! bellowed Marduk, infusing his voice with the power of the warp. Do not turn your back to me, demon. The tallyman glanced back. You have no power over me, dead thing, it said. Not here. Not in the garden. Away. I am done conversing with you. Marduk snarled and drew his bolt pistol, leveling it at the back of the tallyman's head. I thought you said not to anger them, said Saptek in a low voice. In answer, Marduk squeezed the trigger. The bolt hit the tallyman square in the back of its malformed skull. The detonation blew out the front of its face in an explosion of blood, pus, and rotten bone. The shot hurled the tallyman from its chair, as if it had been yanked away from the dark apostle by an invisible cable. The tiny demons screamed in anguish and outrage. Go! shouted Marduk. Get Enesat! The thirteenth broke into a run, angling for the first acolyte. One of them squeezed off a burst of burning Prometheum into the apoplectic mass of tiny toad like demons, which screamed and wailed as they erupted, sizzling and popping. The warrior sprayed a line of flame left and right, consuming them. Still there were thousands more, and they rolled and waddled towards the word-bearers, tiny eyes lit with maliciousness and hatred. One of the thirteenth was borne to the ground by their sheer weight of numbers, disappearing instantly beneath a wave of biting and clawing demons. The thirteenth's bolter were coughing death, and their blades were wet with slime and filth as they carved a path towards the first acolyte. Marduk struck one of the ball-like creatures with his crozius, sending it flying, its putrid flesh blackened by the sharp discharge of energy. The tallyman was not done, however. It pushed itself up from the ground. Its face was a ruin, a gaping crater of blood, mucus, and filth, but still it rose, just as one of the thirteenth ran past. It grabbed the warrior by the helmet, lifting it off its feet. A jagged blade, dripping with corruption, formed in its other hand, coalescing into existence from a mass of repulsive flies. It rammed the blades through the word-bearer's body. The tallyman lifted him high into the air, then hurled him away. By the time he landed, he was already dead. His body transformed into a shrunken, diseased husk. Marduk pumped three shots into the tallyman, turning to fire upon him as he ran by. The bolts detonated in its rotten flesh, blowing great rents into his body but doing nothing to slow it. Sabtek was the first to Enesat's side. With the crackling blade of his sword, he cut away the bindings holding the first acolyte's arms and legs. He helped him to his feet, rusted armor groaning in protest. Marduk stared up at the pitiful figure of Naran, crucified upon the rotting wooden framework. Kill me, the dark apostle moaned. A dull, sonorous bell began to toll, deep bellows and the sound of huge things crashing through the trees beyond the temple followed. We have to go, shouted Sabtek. The tallyman was closing in. Wading steadily through the heavy weight of the fire, the thirteenth were pumping into it. Nothing would slow its implacable advance. We have to go now, said Sabtek. Marduk nodded. Another of the thirteenth had joined Sabtek, supporting Enesat between them. The flamer washed over the demons once more, keeping the tiny ones back. Naran's eyes followed the word bearers as they left him. At the arched entry to the temple, Marduk turned back, taking Sabtek's long-ranged bolter from him. He pressed the stock of the bolter to his shoulder, aiming carefully. He fired just one shot. Naran's head disappeared in a red mist, ending his torment. The tallyman bellowed in fury. Marduk, said Sabtek. The dark apostle turned. 
Huge demons the size of buildings were emerging from the jungle, uprooting trees in their path as they came to answer the tallyman's doling bell. They were foul things, immense versions of the tiny demons that had infested the inside of the templum. More tallymen, scores of them, appeared around these behemoths, staggering towards the stairs atop which the word-bearers found themselves. These demons dragged blades dripping with poison behind them, and their lipless mouths snarled up at them in hatred. But that was not what Sabtek was drawing his attention to. Outside the arch, standing atop the moldering stone stairs, stood Antigone. She reached out to Marduk with one of her tiny child's hands. Come with me. There was no other option. The demons were all around and closing in. Marduk took the augur's hand. Everything changed. There was a retching sense of dislocation, a blinding light, and then they no longer stood upon a demon world beneath the putrid yellow sky. They were no longer within the garden of Nurgle. They stood now upon an irradiated wasteland, a shattered world of ruin and dust, a dying sun, flickering blue and purple, burned in the heavens overhead. A ghost of a smile curled at Marduk's lips. He knew this place. He'd been here before. Where are we? asked Sabtek. This, said Marduk, is Kalth.